Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And thank you very much also for inviting me to speak in this uh, very exciting and uh, interesting conference. Um, I, unfortunately, I can, cannot be there in person in Como, but uh, hopefully in the future, this will be possible. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll speak about, well, I'll give you an overview of um, several things. And the title is Derived Analytic Geometry, but it, you'll see it actually contains much more than analytic geometry. Uh, when, I, when we started thinking about these things, the, you wanted to understand analytic geometry, but then it turned out that we have a context where we can understand much more. Um, another thing, I, just before I start, I would like to say that uh, in terms of kind of the overall uh, direction of this uh, conference, uh, so one thing, this this work really, well, almost everything in here is kind of we owe it to or to Grothendieck, like like a, a lot of so much of mathematics. But uh, in particular, you'll see that kind of what's going on here is uh, like Grothendieck had uh, different uh, let's say stages in his life, like uh, uh, Laurent explained so wonderfully, um, and he started kind of in analysis and then went to do some uh, homological algebra and then algebraic geometry you know, schemes and uh, and then homotopical algebra. And so there was, uh, of course, other like an abelian geometry. There are so many aspects of his work. And uh, and what this does, it does kind of unify the like analytic aspects of his early career with the homological, homotopical and algebraic geometry aspects of his later career. and. Uh, Hopefully, if I get through, uh, you know, this is a slide talk, so there's a chance I prepared too many slides. But if I get through all of them, you'll see that <clears throat> there's lots of echoes with the kind of the things that happened in uh, Lan Kohn's talk uh, and also in Barry Mazur's talk, uh, and definitely kind of in Olivia's uh, talk. I mean, from the beginning, you'll start to see things which are relative. Um, so. This, uh, this is joint work with uh, Federico Bambozzi, Oren ben Bassat, and Jack Haley, and also other people that I will mention later. Just can say that it's partially funded by EPSRC. Um, and the first uh, kind of step where kind of everything happens is this notion of relative algebraic geometry. Again, this uh, relative thing uh, that we've heard about before. Uh, I listed here kind of the main names that in, at least in this kind of approach, uh, what I mean by relative, you see it's not exactly the same relativity, but very close. So of course it kind of originates from Grothendieck and then we heard about the work of his uh, student Hakim and also you know, Deline and Toen Bakia and Toen Batsozi are the kind of people who developed this. Uh, and in this approach kind of what we can say is that geometry in some sense is the kind of marriage of algebra and topology. So what do I mean by this? Um, so by algebra, I mean uh, local models. So if uh, I think about local models, right, we're used to an algebraic geometry that this comes from commutative rings. But if we think more generally, then it, local models should be some type of uh, algebraic structure. Uh, you can formalize this in many different ways. Um, I won't go into kind of details about that. And topology is essentially growth index topology. So after you have your algebra that kind of tells you what are the functions on your local models, then you glue these things together using some growth index topology, and that gives you your geometry. Now, in this kind of relative algebraic geometry setting, algebra means uh, commutative monoids in a symmetric monoidal, perhaps infinity category. Um, so, you know, the basic thing to think about is if you start with the category of uh, abelian groups, then commutative monoids there are just commutative uh, rings. And, and that's kind of, uh, let's say, the, the starting point of algebraic geometry, but you can play with uh, the ingredients. So you can start with a different symmetric monoidal category. And like I said, topology would be um, a derived Grothendieck topology on the category of relative affine schemes. So relative affine schemes will be just the opposite of the category of commutative monoids. Um, 
Now we could use some other algebraic notions. Uh, instead of commutative monoids in a symmetric monoidal category, we can look at presentable categories or other options of what do we mean by algebra. I mean, there's you know, universal algebra is, is one kind of way of thinking about algebra, but uh, uh, there are lots of uh, advantages of looking at this kind of commutative monoids in a symmetric monoidal category that simplify lots of things later. And the question kind of I'll try to answer in this talk is, can we find the relative context? In other words, a symmetric monoidal category with a Grothendieck topology on it, where kind of all the geometries we like, which include kind of algebraic, analytic, differential, and also other geometries that uh, kind of live nicely together. Uh, so in that sense, it's kind of much more than just uh, analytic uh, geometry. You'll see that it will have a context where everything lives together and we can actually glue things from different worlds together and do things uh, kind of globally over Z and in a derived way. So everything will be very nice. And, and again, I want to bring up um, Something, you know, I'm not sure exactly where Grothendieck uh, wrote or said it, but kind of in, in my mind, he somewhere said that it's better to have like a, a, a good category with lots of ugly objects than to have like a bad category or ugly category with only good objects. Um, and that's kind of what is kind of happening here. We'll, we'll have a category that kind of includes lots of things. I mean, more than just kind of uh, algebraic, analytic, differential, like it, it's very big in many ways, but it's very nice. So it's very easy to do lots of things in it. And then you can focus on the types of objects you're interested in. So what we want to, the category is very simple. It's kind of born logical spaces uh, over a Banach ring. So a Banach ring is just a complete norm ring. Um, and we will only look at commutative Banach rings and the examples we have the initial Banach ring, which is <clears throat> the integers with the Archimedean one on it. So this is kind of a way to do um, like a global uh, geometry and this global born logical geometry. Uh, I will later also mention in relation to what kind of uh, Lancon said that uh, there's, we can also define the born logical notions of uh, spectra. In the, so there's kind of a bornological sphere spectrum. So there's, but I'll mention that later. Uh, and then you can look at the Z with the trivial norm. So that's the initial kind of one for the doing non Archimedean geometry. Uh, there's Z, ZP, QP, R. Uh, so the point here is that kind of we have both Archimedean and non Archimedean examples. Um, like I said, Z with Archimedean norm is initial for all of them. So if we can, if we do geometry over that, we can base change to all other types of geometries, both Archimedean and non-Archimedean. Um, and now if we have a Banach ring R, we can talk about Banach R modules. So it's the complete normed R module. Uh, something to kind of mention here is that if R is non-Archimedean, and if it satisfies the ultrametric uh, uh, inequality, then if it's ultrametric, then we don't insist that the modules are also ultrametric. We, we can, I mean, sometimes we, we would, but not in general, especially not if you want to kind of have nice base changes between all the different uh, categories. So we really want something that puts the Archimedean and non-Archimedean together. Um, now we, we get a category which we can call ban R. So the objects are Banacha modules and morphisms are bounded R linear morphisms. Um, and it has a non-full subcategory, which is important and used often. It's kind of the, the non-expanding category where the morphisms have norm less than one. Um, again, I think many of you have seen this, these types of things before, maybe over the complex numbers or the chaotic numbers, but the point is that you can also look at these categories over the integers. Um, now, this, uh, like I said, this, this category has uh, lots of very good properties. Um, so, Banner, and you know, in order to kind of do a geometry, I need a symmetric monoidal category. So, it is a closed symmetric monoidal category. Um, 
it has by the tensor product, this is what's called the projective tensor product, which is the completion of the algebraic tensor product with respect to some um, norm on the on the algebraic tensor product induced from the norms on M and N. Uh, you have kind of the inner home space, which is the Banach module of bounded morphisms between N and N. Um, and this also induces a close symmetric monolith structure on this category of uh, with non-expanding morphisms. Now, in terms of doing kind of homological algebra, um, so this category is not abelian, it's kind of what's called it's quasi abelian, so it's almost abelian, uh, and it has enough kind of compact projectives, uh, which uh, for all practical terms, uh, and I won't go into details, uh, this talk means that everything works as if it's it's an abelian category, essentially. Um, I, again, I won't go into details, but it's very easy to do kind of homological algebra in this category. Um, now, the major drawback of this category of the Banach R modules is that it only has, it's only finitely complete and co-complete. I mean, uh, it doesn't have infinite products or co-products, and that's kind of very easy to see uh, because of boundedness issues. You, you, know, you can see that you cannot define, let's say, an infinite co-product because well, if the norms kind of go to are not bounded, there wouldn't be such an object. Um, now, how do we deal with this? So whenever you have a category, let's say, that has only finitely limits and co-limits, only finite limits and co-limits, you can just look at its incompletion. So this is the category of uh, filtered inductive limits of Banach R modules. Um, you know, so essentially a way of looking at this incompletion is just looking at the look at the Yoneda embedding uh, and look at the functors which are left exact. Um, so now this category is complete and co-complete and still inherits this uh, closed symmetric monodal category. Um, and more than that, it kind of has enough compact projectives. Now it's also quasi-abelian, so it's not abelian, but to any quasi-abelian category can canonically associate an abelian category. But in two different ways, but one is kind of the left heart. Um, and then kind of this left heart is essentially the sifted co-completion of the category of projectives. And you'll see this kind of um, later, I'll talk a bit more about these sifted co-completions and their relations you know, to topos theory also. Um, so, so essentially kind of in terms of uh, the relative context I'm talking about where you can do everything, this is it. I mean, uh, we have this very nice closed symmetric model category of uh, in the Banach modules, and uh, we can now look at commutative monoids in here and, and start doing everything. Um, just one remark about this before I go on: that there is another option. You know, if you have this finitely completed co-complete category uh, like Ban R here, and you want to add infinite products and co-products. Uh, uh, what you can do is you can also look at pro, at the pro completion, uh, kind of uh, look at projective limits, filtered projective limits, and and this actually gives you a, essentially a version of the complete locally convex topological spaces over R. You know, it's one way of defining something like this, uh, even if R is Z, so that's the way of defining this. Uh, the only problem with taking the pro direction is that you lose the, the closed symmetric monodal structure, right? Just because of the where the junctions kind of want to go. So if you take the pro, your monoidal structure will commute with limits and so shouldn't be really closed. But if we take the end, our monoidal structure, we may make it commute with co-limits and it can stay closed. Uh, so so that's one of the reasons it's better to kind of choose this end completion. Um, now inside this kind of in of Banar, we have this kind of subcategory of essentially monomorphic objects. So these are these uh, filtered systems that are uh, equivalent or isomorphic to a system where all the morphism are monomorphisms. And we call this Borna or Bornological spaces. So this is the category of Bornological R modules. And the nice thing about it is that it's a concrete category. So it has a, a natural forgetful functor to sets is faithful. 
So the difference between in, uh, ban, and kind of born R is that this in completion is, well, it's very easy to define categorically, but it's hard to exactly see the objects there. Born R, you can actually think of them as sets with extra structures, with bornologies, essentially. Um, this is also complete, co-complete, and closed symmetric monodal category. So we can also use this as our con you know, relative context for geometry. Um, the thing to notice is that they actually they have kind of the same compact projective, so which makes them derive equivalent. Uh, so definitely, if you're kind of interested in doing a, a kind of derived geometry, it doesn't really matter which one you use, um, and we'll kind of. I'll interchange between both of them all the time. Now, just as an interlude, I want to kind of relate, well, there, there's much more to say than what I'll say here, but relate this to kind of this condensed mathematics, which is another option of how to do kind of global versions of uh, analytic and derived geometry. So there is a very nice relationship. Um, and it starts kind of with this idea of uh, sifted co-completion. Um, so the sifted co-completion of a category is kind of where, again, relates to the Yoneda embedding, where we look at functors which are uh, kind of finite product preserving. So the pre sheaves that uh, satisfy this product, that, you know, they send a, co a finite co-product to a finite product. Um, like I said, that this is a, it's a full subcategory of, of all pre sheaves, uh, and it kind of contains the, the and, uh, the essential image of the another embedding. So, and it is essentially, it's called the sifted co-completion because what it is, I mean, you know, about kind of, I t told you before about int completions, which have to do with filtered co-limits. This kind of uh, is the universal category that adds sifted co-limits. Um, so now we'll assume that kind of C is a small category with finite co-products. Uh, so when we kind of call the initial object by the empty set, and we can define a, a Grothendieck topology on, on such a category, it's called kind of the, the eta topology, and it's it's not a very interesting like kind of it's essentially saying that uh, a cover is just a finite family of morphisms such that the canonical morphism from the co-product of, of these objects uh, to X is an isomorphism. So you just take an object and kind of you pull it apart uh, into a, a finite number of pieces. Um, and so this is the Gaeta topology. And like any Grothendieck topology, we can associate a site to it. And then we can associate kind of the sheaves on the site. So this is the Gaeta topos. And um, now we call a category extensive if kind of if you look at the in, if, for any two objects, if you intersect them. Inside the co product, you get the, the initial object. So the intersection is empty. That's kind of you're used to in you know, like sets or topological spaces. And then it's a very easy exercise that this kind of uh, Gaeta topos is in this, it sees extensive, is the sifted co completion. A nice exercise for you. Um, so Let's uh, fix a strongly inaccessible cardinal, and we look at kind of the category of sets with cardinality strictly less than kappa, uh, which is an example of a small extensive category. Now, if we have such a set, we can this define kind of bornologies in the set. So bornology, you know, there, there, you know, if you think about the history of mathematics, some of our analysis shows for various reasons to discuss, to focus on notions of uh, open subsets, but in the same way, it could have chosen to kind of think about uh, uh, bounded subsets. So, so this is what pornologies are all about. And, and in many ways, it's, it's kind of the difference between choosing, like, like I said before, the pro-completion or the incompletion. And in many ways, incompletions are actually much well, more well-behaved. So, in many ways, I think if uh, historically mathematics chose to do analysis using bornologies instead of uh, topologies, a lot of kind of algebra in this uh, analytic context would have been much easier, and it is much easier. So a bornology is just kind of a collection of subsets which cover X and is stable under inclusions. 
and a stable under finite unions. And if we have kind of a, a set with a bonology on it, we call it a naive bonological set. Usually they're called bonological sets, but you see that kind of, uh, we have reasons to call them naive. Or they don't capture enough data. And, well, if you work over rings like Z, for instance, uh, I mean, if your ring is very kind of discrete, then you, you need more data to capture really what you need. Um, and then if you have kind of a morphism of a bonological set, the uh, morphism of sets, let's say, you call it bounded if it sends uh, the bounded sets to bounded sets. Uh, and, um, and this kind of clearly forms a category. So you can compose such things and you get a category which you call born kappa. So objects are just naive bonological sets of cardinality less than kappa. And, uh, and then kind of, uh, you can also take the co-limit uh, over kind of larger and larger kappa and, and look, get kind of a big category of all uh, naive bonological sets, right? Just taking the co-limit of these categories. Um, now, the nice thing uh, kind of, which people noticed uh, is already, I think, in the 70s or 80s, is that uh, this category born is actually a full subcategory of the Gaeta topos. So again, sets kappa, or you know, sets of cardinality strictly less than kappa, is an extensive category. You can take the sifted co-completion of it, or if you want uh, kind of the Gaeta topos of this category, and there is a very nice uh, embedding of uh, this category of uh, bornological sets into it. Uh, and in some ways, they're kind of, you can see that what they are are kind of these separated objects. And, and this is related to these kind of essentially monomorphic objects. Um, and in the same way that uh, kind of we, we talk about bornological sets, we can talk about bornological abelian groups. So in other words, if you want abelian group objects in this Gaeta topos or just functors into the category of like sheaves of abelian groups on this side. Uh, and it's a very nice kind of abelian category. So it's abelian, it satisfies all these kind of Grotendek axioms. It has enough uh, projective objects and it's generated by compact projective objects. So this is a, a way of creating a, a very nice uh, abelian category that also has a symmetric monoidal structure, a close symmetric monoidal structure, and is related to kind of what I said before in terms of one logical R models. But, uh, now, how, how do we kind of get to condensed mathematics uh, or condensed sets out of this? So on this category of sets kappa, we have the ultra filter monad. So to any set, we can associate all the ultra filters in S. Uh, so this is, a monad on this uh, this category, um, and to a monad we can associate different uh, different categories. Kind of we can associate the category of what, what here I call modules, and often usually they're called algebra over the monad. Um, but uh, here I'll just call them modules over the monad, and this is kind of the Eilenberg Moor category, and there's a canonical adjunction between our original category and modules, algebras over this monad. And there's the free module uh, or free algebra construction and the forgetful functor. Now, if we look at the essential image of the free module functor, in other words, we kind of look at the full subcategory on three modules, we get what's called the Kleisley category of the monad and we denoted by KL of M. And there is this uh, quite well-known, I think, theorem by Anise that says the following, that if you uh, look at the category of modules over this, uh, um, uh, this ultra-filter monad, uh, you get the category of the compact, compact Hausdorff spaces of cardinality less than kappa. Um, so it's a very nice way of kind of starting just from the category of sets, well, the small category of sets, and this notion of ultra-filters, and you get the category of uh, the compact Hausdorff spaces out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is well, very interesting for this to develop lots of notions and kind of topology in constructive ways. And there was a lot to discuss this. Uh, and then 
using, well, we can also define kind of kappa condensed sets as, well, either define it or it's, if you define it, it's equivalent to the Gaeta topos of this Kleisley category. So in other words, we kind of take the free objects. Uh, so kind of like uh, we take this stone check compactifications of these sets less than kappa, and this is an extensive category, and you take the essentially the sifted co-completion of this Gaeta topos. Uh, and it's kind of, you can see that essentially taking the sifted co-completion uh, is a two-step operation, really. You first introduce uh, uh, kind of co-equalizers or reflexive, co-reflexive co-equalizers, and then you take the incompletion. So if you introduce the co-equalizers, you get the compact hazard spaces, and then you take the incompletion of that. So that's another way of thinking about kind of condensed sets. And you know, because we have this uh, ultra filter monad uh, that sends actually a set to the free object to, or to the cli get an object in this Kleisley category, you get in this way an adjunction between uh, you know these condensed sets and these morphological sets, um, which you know again just is a, you can think of it as an application of uh, of topos theory to with this very easy get of topology. Um, and this also induces an adjunction between abelian group objects, and, and this has kind of nice properties. Uh, so the, the functor from uh, condensed uh, abelian groups, uh, well, the functor from phonological abelian groups to condensed abelian groups is kind of yeah, oplax monoidal, so it's not, not exactly monoidal, but very close. And the other one is strongly monoidal. And you can also get kind of adjunctions between the derived categories using this. Um, now, very soon uh, the, we'll have a paper out that kind of explains all of this and gives all the details. And we we are trying to use this actually to kind of the point you see is that uh, well, if you've learned a little about kind of condensed sets and condensed abelian groups, um, it's not so easy kind of to construct kind of uh, analytic rings in, in this context, but it's very easy to construct, uh, and I'll show you later, examples of analytic rings in this phonological setting. So um, so we kind of can use this relationship to uh, transport things and construct, uh, you know, use analytic phonological rings and we get kind of uh, condensed analytic rings using that. Um, also to notice is that just by construction, right, you see that these phonological sets or phonological abelian groups are very simple objects. I and mean, you really just start with the category of sets. And from that perspective, it's a very easy constructive type object in, in some sense. And you'll also see it later. Well, I mentioned something about these uh, also phonological kind of R modules from before. They are also, their projective generators are L1 spaces. Now, when you go to the condensed world, you see that you have these ultra filters or this stone check compactification, which is something very non constructive. Essentially, we really, except for, well, we don't know how interesting ultra filters really look like. I mean, we need the axiom of choice or things like that. Uh, you know, there are questions about measurable cardinals that can come into the, to this. So, in many ways, condensed abelian groups uh, is, is, uh, it's a difficult category. I mean, it's complicated. And is, um, so uh, the phonological approach, uh, I think, is simpler, but uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of taste. Now, I just kind of want to say a bit more about how to extend this kind of category of, uh, instead of just looking at sets, which, like, like I said before, doesn't capture enough data, if, especially if you work over let's say discrete uh, uh, norm or Banach rings, we need the category of uh, norm sets, um, well, of cardinality less than kappa. So this is very easy to define. It's, kind of, it's, a, it's a category of uh, sets with uh, a norm. So it's a map to R plus. But the point is, it's just, you know, if it was just a category of sets with a function to R plus, it wouldn't be so interesting. The point is that the morphisms are, we, we only allow kind of bounded morphisms. So in the same way that you would do you know, for norm the billion groups or for Banach uh, uh, modules and so on, then you, you ask that kind of there's a, 
there's a, a bound for your map in terms of the norms of the set. So this category is actually becomes very different than the category of sets with functions in them. Um, it, it's still extensive, and we can again look at the category of uh, kind of the Gaeta topos. So this is like norm bornological sets. Um, so uh, in the in the same way, we can kind of look at norm bornological abelian groups. Um, and by the way, to relate this to kind of the to the, the talk from earlier today by Alain Kohn, we can also look at uh, kind of other versions. We have these kind of norm sets or norm bornological sets. So we can develop other just any type of uh, definition. Uh, Alan looked at would work here as well. So you just get kind of the, the norm version of this. Um, and uh, just a remark about these norm sets. I mean, in a slightly different way, we already used them uh, in a previous paper to kind of construct a, a slightly naive version of an analytic field with one element. And we, we could define uh, like a version of the far contained curve over this uh, analytic version, what what I mean by define it, it's we define an object there, like a geometric object that would base change to a far contained curve, let's say over QP, but it also had the base change over the complex numbers, and this base base change over the complex numbers was actually very much related to this uh, Boston system. But I, I won't discuss this here uh, today. Um, and again, this this category has all the kind of Good properties you might expect. Uh, it's a billion category, satisfies the kind of Grothendieck axioms, and it has enough projective objects. It's generated by compact projective objects, and it has a natural closed order structure. Uh, and for instance, you can embed the category of norm rings fully faithfully into this category of, of commutative monoids over this uh, uh, norm the billion norm bornological abelian groups. So uh, it's it's a very nice place actually to do also relative geometry and that's something we're actually now developing. So we, like I said, we can use this for, as, as our kind of relative context, as our base symmetric monoidal category. The nice thing about this is that it kind of includes very easily spaces of non-convex types such as p of spaces and i think using this you can also relate it to tropical geometry um, i mean maybe one way of thinking about just a short remark is that you know, if you i mean like in, in one of the previous talks like the ostrovsky's theorem was mentioned and uh, or if you kind of know this picture of the berkovich tree of kind of Berkowitz spectrum of, of the integers of Z, then you, you see kind of that in the non Archimedean cases, if you have a non Archimedean, you know, say the Piadic norm, you can take it to any power, you know, from this uh, to any power epsilon. Uh, but in the Archimedean norm, if you want to stay kind of Banach, you can only, because things have to be convex, uh, you can only take it to you know, the Archimedean norm to a power which is between zero and one. Now, and there's this kind of uh, discrepancy that kind of, well, in the non Archimedean cases, you can sort of go to infinity and end up in the finite field. Uh, I think in this context, we can also, I can tell you, well, I don't have time today, but I can tell you how to define a spectrum in, in that very great generality. Again, using the ideas coming from topos theory, we, for me, a spectrum is uh, just you have a topos and you just look at the, the topological space associated or to the, this topos. Um, if I mean our toposes will have enough points, so um, so you can kind of uh, what I think this would do is kind of extend the Archimedean branch of this tree to infinity as well, and then at infinity there be something that might be kind of this tropical geometry, but. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So, anyway. um, now, something that it is quite kind of easy to do using this is uh, use the final norm bornological spectra. Uh, and like I say, your bounded cohomology is actually a very natural 
object in there. So if you think about, you know, usually kind of spectra are objects that um, they define cohomology theories, uh, kind of generalized cohomology theories, um, or it gives you a category where generalized cohomology theories become uh, representable by these uh, spectra. And you can ask, well, what happens? What what do you do with bounded cohomology? How do you represent this? And uh, and this is kind of a context where this is quite easy to do. Essentially, you know, instead of taking the kind of sifted co-completion of this category valued, let's say, in sets, uh, you can take it valued in simplicial sets or in spectra. So you can um, do that. And, and this kind of defines these uh, normed phonological spectra very easily. Um, and just a basic example to think about, if you have a simplicial set, Essentially, you can get a norm simplicial set, just you put the constant norm one on it. Now, if you base change this, you know, if you take the completed base change with any norm ring, uh, you essentially get L1 homology. That's kind of just a very basic observation how you kind of can get from these, uh, uh, these constructions like uh, notions coming from bounded homology. Um, now, another thing kind of we can do using this is uh, this allows us to define kind of like biological motives enriched in normal biological spectra, uh, which is very interesting because if you think about it, what this really tells you is you, you can kind of define like analytic motivic cohomology that now comes naturally with norms somehow. And, um, and there's an idea that um, uh, one can one can do interesting things with this, so that I won't have time to discuss. But uh, there, there is, you know, you can use this hopefully to give a arithmetic version of this kind of uh, uh, Milner Wood inequalities that you know uh, in the you know, in the geometric or topological setting, uh, and and actually the these kind of arithmetic versions of Milner wood inequalities are the Spiro inequality. So this, this construction could lead to a, a, another proof of uh, the ABC conjecture. But again, this is uh, uh, in the future. Okay, now back to kind of the, so this was this interlude about um, uh, well, relationship with uh, condensed mathematics and Actually, by thinking about this relationship, we came up with, in some ways, maybe more flexible ways of doing this relative uh, geometry. And I'll go back to kind of what has been developed. So, like I said, so we have this Banach ring R, and we look at the category of complete phonological R modules. And then a phonological commutative uh, ring is just a, a commutative monoid object there. So let's start giving, seeing that there are lots of examples of these things and they're actually very easy to construct. Um, so for any phonological space where this category is co-complete, uh, we can just define its symmetric algebra. Um, so for instance, in this way, essentially what we get is um, something like polynomials with their fine bonology. Um, so, so you see that already kind of in this way, you, you can embed like usual ring theory into this phonological setting, just with this uh, fine monology. So this category actually, uh, the, the local objects would contain everything that is contained in algebraic geometry, but we want to get off, there are many more examples of objects in there, kind of analytic type examples. Um, so here is kind of this, uh, the category of, uh, this non-expanding category is actually already co-complete. And that's you know, very easy to see. I mean, this is kind of, the co-completion is essentially like a, an L1 or summability condition. So we can define this kind of non-expanding um, symmetric algebra. Um, so where I write this kind of co-product less than equal to one, this is the co-product in the category uh, of non-expanding uh, with, morphisms. So yeah, like I said, this category is co-complete. Now, uh, for example, if you look at kind of what happens if you do it on R, what you get is, is a Tate algebra. Well, 
because like I said in the beginning, you can make choices if uh, you take, um, if you look at modules which are Archimedean or non-Archimedean, depending on R, but for now everything was Archimedean, so this would be an Archimedean plate algebra of analytic functions on a closed unit you know, disk. In other words, just kind of formal power series that uh, converge, have a radius of convergence one. Uh, where by that I mean in terms of kind of summability. So the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients is, uh, is finite. Um, and in a similar way, if we kind of rescale our rings, we can get uh, Archimedean Tate algebras of analytic functions on a closed polydisc with these radii. Um, and like I said, if we can also kind of uh, look at non Archimedean Banach modules, and then the above construction would be kind of the usual Tate algebra in the non Archimedean setting. Um, now, using these kind of basic analytic objects, these state algebras, we can define, let's say, functions on the open unit disk. So this is kind of, here we're using the fact that the category is completed, co-complete. So we can get this Frechet type algebra of taking the limit when the radius is less than one of these state algebras. Or we can get also overconvergent analytic functions. Uh, so here, this is the co-limit when the radius is bigger than one. Of these state algebras. Or we can define analytic functions on closed, open, and half closed anuli. So, for instance, this, if we do this, uh, we can get, get kind of over any Banach ring a definition of the robber ring, if you've seen it before. Uh, and really, the beautiful thing about this is the following remark that, uh, I mean, when you look at these logical rings that kind of are involve open or over convergent conditions, um, then the Archimedean and non Archimedean definitions are equivalent. So, what do I mean by that? Uh, of course, if you look at the Tate algebra itself, like functions on a closed disk, then the Archimedean Tate algebra and non Archimedean Tate algebra are, are different. But if you start taking limits and co limits between them, you can see that. Uh, you can define this, you know, suppose you're over a non Archimedean uh, uh, ring or field, the, non the definition that involves a limit or a co limit with the non Archimedean Tate algebra, or the one involving the Archimedean Tate algebras, you get isomorphic objects uh, because the, these, two co these two diagrams actually have maps between them. They're maps between the Archimedean and non Archimedean definition if you change the radius of it. So, so what this means is that. If you look, for instance, at let's say functions on the, or let's say overconvergent functions on the closed, on the disk of radius one, you can define this over the integers, and then when you base change this to the complex numbers, you get Archimedean overconvergent functions, and when you base change this to the, let's say QP, you get non-Archimedean overconvergent functions. So they get really this kind of Archimedean non-Archimedean notions get unified. Uh, so this is kind of what I, I hint here that you get in this way kind of global objects and you don't kind of need to compactify spec Z. This is an extra statement. And of what this means is that um, really, uh, you know, in our of geometry, you, well, like we've heard in talks before that you, know, you need to add the point at infinity. I mean, this analytic uh, spec Z, when you work over Z with its Archimedean norm, it, it is, you can actually show that it is essentially glued from Z triv and not exactly R, but something close to R. Um, so, and it's glued in the sense that you can do descent. So for instance, to give an object over Z, you need to give an object over Z triv, which is a kind of, Z triv is essentially like doing algebraic geometry. Algebraic and formal geometry is kind of what Z triv does. It sees all the non-Archimedean kind of uh, places, and and then you you need to glue to it something that happens at the Archimedean place. Um, so actually, this gives a new approach to our Kellogg geometry, and for this we I'll have to discuss more this kind of notion of uh, this motivic like global motivic uh, analytic geometry, which uh, is actually glued from essentially algebraic motivic homology 
and, and what happens at over the complex number. Um, other examples which are really interesting is kind of locally analytic functions. Um, so we can define them as a biological space. They are the same space as the overconvergent, but the algebra structure uses the multiplication table of binomials. I don't think I'll have time to discuss this more, but uh, yeah, there, there is, we can define this again over an Ivanov ring. And over QP, we get kind of locally analytic functions on the closed disk. Um, and we can, this also kind of works in Archimedean case. Uh, and these algebras that I told you about kind of have these really nice base chain properties that uh, you can base change them using this completed tensor product and get from you know, move between different rings. So for instance, like if I look at the overconvergent functions over Z, I will by base change to any Banach ring, I'll get overconvergent functions over S. Same thing with the robber ring or with these locally analytic functions. An interesting thing about the locally analytic functions is that you can also define them over the complex numbers. Of course, there, there's no notion of locally analytic, but what you get is a space of functions which have the convergent Newton series. Um, so this, uh, these are some functions of exponential type, which uh, are very interesting. Uh, they're actually related to Alan Kohn's talk, but I'm not sure I'll have time to discuss this. Another really interesting example, you know, I told you about differential uh, geometry. So of course, if you work over the real or numbers, let's say, then functions of uh, like, I mean, differentiable functions are also examples of uh, bonological uh, algebras. Uh, and also in another Archimedean setting. But what's really interesting is that, uh, you know, you can use this to define a Z form of, let's say, C infinity functions on an interval. Uh, using kind of Chebyshev polynomials, there is a bornological algebra over Z that if you base change it to the real number, you get uh, C infinity functions on the interval. So this approach actually allows you to define and do kind of differential geometry like over the integers and also discuss like uh, uh, kind of Z forms of differentiable manifolds. Um, okay. So this was kind of just examples of what kind of type of rings you can get in it. Now, how do you do analytic geometry? So this, this is kind of the topos theoretic approach. Uh, we take the functor of points approach. So we have this kind of category of com R of commutative bonological rings over R. And then we define the category of analytic affine schemes over R as just the opposite category. So this is affine over R. So you know, often when you do kind of learn algebraic geometry, this becomes a theorem. Here we just take this as a definition. Um, and now we can look at three sheets on this category. And uh, just which is kind of what the functor of points does. So for any commutative uh, chronological R uh, algebra, we associate the set in a functorial way. Um, and now we can define Grotendieck topologies on this category and look at categories of sheaves. And then, and then we can also look at categories of sheaves that are locally affine and get schemes or get stacks. Uh, if we look at, well, for stacks, we kind of we look at categories of uh, like functors into categories or functors into groupoids, but uh, this will appear soon. Uh, just a remark about what I said before, we can internalize these categories of logical sets and condensed sets by looking at kind of what happens with the, these basic objects and kind of we need to internalize the notion of the discrete. And there are two ways of doing it. You either just kind of take, uh, you know, disjoint copies of spec Z, this analytic spec Z. So this would kind of gives you discrete sets and then you can look at the Gaeta topology on, on these objects. Or if you want to get the condensed thing, you, you need to look at these uh, contracting products of Z and look at spec of them. So this is a form of integral Gelfan duality. You can actually see that maps of algebras between these things are the same thing as maps between the stone check compactifications. So this kind of comes from the fact that uh, essentially continuous functions on the stone check compactifications are the same thing as bounded 
uh, functions. Um, now, there is a very kind of interesting thing that happens is that if you want to do analytic geometry and kind of want to get the correct Grotendieck topologies, you have to work in the derived setting. So, I mean, often when you think about derived, let's say, geometry or algebraic geometry, the reasons are kind of, you know, we have perfectly good non derived algebraic geometry, but uh, you want to extend it for various reasons. I mean, in the analytic context, uh, it turns out that even to kind of get the correct underlying analytic geometry, you already have, in case if you work in this context, you have to work in a derived setting. So that's again kind of very easy to do. We look at kind of simplicial commutative one logical rings, and then we can look at the opposite of this category. Um, so we can think of them as derived analytic, well, or derived one logical affine schemes over R. Um, and then we look at simplicial pre sheaves over this. So kind of all functors from this into simplicial sets. Um, and we call these analytic or bonological pre stacks. And now we can introduce the kind of uh, homotopy Grotendieck topologies here. Again, there's kind of flat, smooth, et al. And homotopies are risky. That that's kind of turns out to be important. We can define kind of n geometric derived stacks. And, and the nice thing about this kind of relative approach is that it's very easy to define quasi coherencies, which is actually quite a big problem in analytic uh, geometry. So quasi coherent sheaves are over spec A are just the category of chronological or complete bonological A modules. And it turns out that kind of many of these topologies, they satisfy derived descent, uh, which kind of means that kind of quasi coherent sheaves on the stackification for this, uh, this topology are equivalent to quasi coherent sheaves on the pre stack. So that's something we often use. Um, see, I'm almost running out of time. I'll, I'll try to finish. Um, Kind of prepare too much, but uh, I'll, I'll finish uh, soon. So just to give you kind of an example of an application. Um, so a homotopy is a risky open immersion uh, between spec A and spec B is kind of, you know, on the level of maps from B to A kind of means that the, if you look at the completed derived tensor product of A with A over B, the multiplication map, that this is uh, an equivalence in the Kind of homotopy category of A modules. And so that turns out to be like a fundamental concept in this. Uh, uh, in this, this was almost kind of the starting point of all of this. And this is why you need to work in a derived setting if you want to see these kind of opens. Um, and then you can call it a cover if, if you get kind of a conservative family of functors on, on the level of modules. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that just from these definitions, I mean, it's kind of a, a nice exercise in kind of a higher category theory. You get that if you have a family of homotopies or risky open embeddings, then it's a cover if and only if you, the associated kind of K check complex is uh, cyclic. Now, notice that this is a derived uh, kind of check complex. So I, I have to use derived tensor products everywhere. And like a nice application of this is that uh, we can define, you know, if you know one of the interesting problems in kind of approaches to analytic geometry, if it's kind of like Berkovich or Adic spaces or and so on, there's this kind of sheafiness problem that the structure of pre sheaf is not always a sheaf, at least if you have for some kind of complicated Banach algebras that can appear actually. So we can define kind of a, a different using these notions, like instead of like Bertrand and one localizations, we can define kind of their derived version, essentially using Kozul complexes. Uh, um, and there are examples of these homotopy epimorphisms. And using this, we can define kind of like derived rational localizations. And there will also be examples of homotopy epimorphism. So, um, and then, you know, if you have an affinoid algebra, uh, but again, here, this can be much more general than the usual. Uh, we can talk about lots of uh, you know, these interesting examples. Again, just out of these definitions, you get that this 
derived HA complex uh, is a cyclic, um, which implies that you know, the derived structure sheaf is a sheaf, uh, well, a homotopy sheaf. So, uh, and you can do very nice calculations in some basic examples, which are kind of non sheafy in the non derived setting. And see that kind of the non sheafiness really has to do with some you know, missing, maybe, well, you write down some double complex, you compute its cohomology, you see it's not exact. And the reason, you know, you have some missing H1 or H2, and, and introducing these kind of causal complexes fixes this, and everything becomes exact, as well, as the kind of theorem tells you. And it's nice to do the calculation. Um, so this, this kind of solves the sheafiness problem. Um, yeah, I think I'm maybe out of time. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to tell you, well, more exact, well, more applications, but I don't have time. I mean, one is about kind of how to analytic group schemes. So essentially, in this context, you can look at, well, group schemes. And by, you know, if you start with the commutative Hopf algebra in you know, important logical R modules, uh, and then, it turns out that these group schemes are related to bounded continuous cohomology. If I have a profinite group, I can associate group schemes and I can get moduli spaces of Galois, like derived moduli spaces of Galois representations very easily defined in this way. Uh, and then the other topic I wanted to discuss is um, how to define something I call um, uh, kind of arithmetic filtrations, which is a globally defined object that kind of captures all like all the local phi gamma modules plus a filtration at infinity. So it's a very nice way of kind of getting like uh, analytic families of phi gamma modules. By analytic, I mean analytic over Z, not analytic for a fixed P. Um, and the kind of things that are involved there uh, are in many ways related to what Korn was discussing in his. Uh, this talk, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the time. I mean, uh, so maybe some other time we can discuss this. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>